at Mission Park Elementary. At Mission Park Elementary, um, I've taught fifth grade for a very long time. And this year I'm going to be our site intervention specialist and MTSS teacher. Also the communications chair for Monterey Bay Q. And I'm Laura Carey. I'm a former fifth grade teacher about to become a sixth grade teacher at Montebello Elementary in Alisal. And yeah, I'm a, a tech liaison at my site and Monterey Bay Q's uh, secretary. So that is who we are. So if you're just joining us, we have a bit.ly right here um, that uh, will take you to our presentation. We have a lot of links and resources for you. So you might want to snag that. And I believe Jacob will also be dropping that in the chat as well. He'll be listed as Monterey Bay Q officially. So there we go. And that is who we are right there. So if you want to get a hold of us, this is our contact information. All right, so for those of you that may not know, um, G Suite changed its name recently to Google Workspace. And Laura and I have been talking about how we need to get used to using the term Google Workspace um, because we called it G Suite for so long. So um, that's why we are referring to it as Google Workspace. Next slide, please. Yep. So there aren't many differences between G Suite and Google Workspace. The functionality of most of the apps remain the same, um, but Google decided to help it to cater more to remote workers as well as in-person or in-office workers. Um, it supports collaboration in a more meaningful way, and it does a better job at um, allowing the Google apps to seamlessly um, switch between each other. Um, and we'll show you how that works. Um, it also has some upgraded security and analytics, which we won't be going into, but just so you know, it's there. All right. So our goal for, this, for tonight is that you'll come step away with ways to simplify your school year. Uh, we're really focusing on ways that you can have clear communication with your, with not only just with your students, but also with the parents in your, um, of the students in your, in your classroom, the guardians, anyone who's caregiving for your children, for your students. A way is that you can maintain engagement in your classroom, as well as utilizing free tools. But we also wanted to focus on things that are really useful, um, things that will um, maximize your time in the classroom, but without being, because sometimes you get great free tools, but there's just so many of them and you don't know which ones to choose and you feel like you're jumping from tool to tool. We really wanted to focus in on some solid, um, easy to use tools, as well as just focusing on, there's multiple platforms out there. There are some great platforms that you can use in your classroom, but really focusing tonight on the Google Workspace platform and things that interact and like, um, just enhance your workspace experience. So which of the following do you think will be will simplify your school year the most? And these are the six uh, things that we're hoping to, that we'll cover, we are planning to cover during our uh, presentation tonight. So if you wouldn't mind just dropping in the chat real quickly, which of these do you think would be the most useful? Or your <laughs> Awesome. First person in says forms. <laughs> All right, we got forms in sight. <laughs> Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm seeing a lot of forms. Mind maps is something that a lot of people don't know about. So hopefully that's something that we can kind of touch on tonight. And if and that's okay, if you don't know how to use any of them, that's what we're, we're gonna be giving you some tips and tools on how to integrate those into your classroom. Well, I see a lot of responses for forms. So Krista, you are in luck because I, I think, if I remember correctly, that's what we're starting with right after this. It is, it is. all right, the pressure's on. I know. <laughs> all right. So let's go ahead. So we took a poll and some of you, probably filled this out, but asking um, which Google Workspace apps do you find the most helpful doing your job? And you can see the results here. A lot of people said um, Docs and Drive. I totally agree. Um, but you can kind of see 
there are some others that didn't get as many votes and I'm hoping that we can increase those votes um, as we go on and you learn how to use these tools. Uh, that word cloud there is just kind of the feedback that teachers um, and administrators gave um, about Google Workspace. It helps them feel more organized. It's portable, it's collaborative, it's shareable. Um, it is, it's, it's amazing. So um, we'll go ahead and move on. All right, Google Forms, let's get started. All right, so here are some ways you can use Google Forms. This is just a list of a few of the ways that um, we have used them in the past. Um, I'll go into detail on a few of them, but I wanted you to have access to this list um, and you have access to the bit.ly. So feel free to refer back to this. Um, this one is one that as a classroom teacher, I tend to use every year and it's an information gatherer kind of, and I send it out to families, preferably on the first day of school. And it gets information such as um, where the child is going to go after school, gets me all the parents contact information or grandparents or wherever the student lives, anything I need to be aware of um, concerns strengths, things like that. And so um, there's a copy here for you if you access it in the bit.ly. And I believe Jacob was gonna put a copy of it in the chat as well. So feel free to use this back to school survey when you return to school. All right, so Google Forms is also great for feedback and not just from um, parents, but also from the students. So I like to do an end of the year survey just to kind of see what went well, what the kids really enjoyed, what stood out. Mid-year is good. Um, on the list here, I've got distance learning feedback. When in 2020, when we went into distance learning, I did not know what I was doing. And I sent out this feedback form to the families and they gave me some really great suggestions about how I could improve the remainder of the school year. So it's a really powerful tool and it makes the families feel heard, I think as well. So it's great for um, end of unit feedback, um, checking in for our social emotional learning, and then ongoing feedback. So I like to have um, a feedback form on my class website that kids and parents can fill out anytime they want. But um, I wanted to make sure I pointed out that you're going to want to enable email alerts for this form. Otherwise, you won't know that people have filled it out. Okay. Interest inventories is another great way to use forms. So I like to identify um, what my students like to read or if they don't like to read, um, I wanna know that at the beginning of the year too. That way I can help them um, find the right books, right? So it also um, helps support my teaching and guide my teaching. There's also a copy here for you if you'd like to use this interest inventory template. Um, this is for the coaches and the administrators out there. You want your staff to feel heard. Um, do a needs analysis. What do your teachers need? Um, make them feel heard. And you can also do this with your families as well. All right, so this saved me um, in the past year with virtual teaching. Self-grading quizzes, if you haven't used them, please use them. So um, they're great for any subject. The multiple choice scores, um, multiple choice will score automatically. And it can also be directly imported into your Google Classroom grade book. So um, be aware of this and try it. Yes, Laura, exit tickets, absolutely. Um, with your self-grading quizzes, you can then export the data and you can get these charts and graphs identifying the trends um, of the questions the kids got right or the questions they got wrong. It'll help guide your teaching moving forward. And with that being said, let's talk about sheets. All right, so sheets are my jam. I love sheets because this is where you get to take all that great data that you just collected in all your forms and manipulate it and change it and. I mean, hopefully not change it too much because it is, you know, you're not trying to actually change the data, but you're trying to use it a lot, utilize it in the proper ways. So I'm gonna go over a couple tools and just some things that I use 
most often when it comes to sheets. And um, one of my first tool is Formula, and that link is will take that link right there is designed to take you to just a quick tutorial on how to use it. But what it and it's much better than I can do, and it can be done. Really, I don't have time. We don't have time today to go into formula completely, but basically it's an add-on. So your district may have to enable it or you might not be able to use it. But it's an add-on that you can use in Sheets that will then send you an email. And you can also have it send an email to multiple people. So maybe you're not the only tech person at your site and you have multiple people who handle technology or you're an admin and you need to like, okay, someone filled out a, for a referral form for a student behavior and you wanna send it to multiple. Uh, to multiple people like your secretary, the, uh, to your AP, or to the principal, you want to have it copy three people on it, it would then, you can decide what it would send. So you can decide, designate so that when someone fills out a form, an email is automatically generated. It could be a thank you for this response, here's the next step response. It could be, here's what happened in the form. So that way you have a copy of it. But basically, it's a great way for you to get that feedback. I used it on one of my um, on one of my SEL forms, kind of like my if you have a problem or you need Ms. Carrie to know something form. But I didn't check that form every day. I checked, you know. But this way, I got a response. If, if someone filled it out, I then got a response, and I got an email saying, "Hey, you have a response waiting for you." And it was something that I could share with other people as well. It could have been a little broader, but it's a great way to do it. And it's actually how I figured out that another teacher had shared my form without making a copy of it first. They had shared the link to my form. And so all of a sudden I had these kids were filling out my form and I'm like, these aren't them. That's not my class. And I was able to catch that that way. So it's a great little tool for being able to get emails regarding your form. Um, it could, I, I don't think it could be used to send grades or missing assignments. I mean, the student would have to enter in, it has to collect an email address to send it from. So either the student would have to self enter the email address that they wanted their grade to be sent to, but it could get, and that could get a little interesting because you might have a student who just enters a random email address at that point because they don't want their parent to get their grade. That's a good question, Margaret. There, I do, there is a, but there is a way that you can share some of that in our next slide, actually, I think. So another tool I've, I've discovered, about, and this is something that you can do with every single Google um, product, pretty much, whether it's docs, slides, and they all have slightly different functionalities. But when you publish a Google Sheet, it basically provides you with a link to an uneditable view-only web page. And so you can publish just one sheet, you can publish all the sheets. So what I did is I had a sheet per student, and each of my students had, basically I could log their progress, whether they completed the work for the day, I could enter scores, and then I could send a private link to, I mean, it's an active link, it's not private, but it's a specific link to that student's sheet and then share it with the parent. So in that way, I could share students' progress, I could share grades, and it was, I, there was no student identifying information on it. It just had a name or you could use a student not student ID number, but just a student number, like student one, two, three, four, five, and you could then share it with that parent. And that was a great way to be able to share conference schedules because it updates every five minutes. So I could they could see a live picture of what was of what times were available, and also as as I updated what their students had done during the day or what they had had or had not completed, I could update scores and grades they could then have a live picture of that as well. It also limits editing and copying because you can't just make a copy of it and edit from there. So publishing is a really powerful tool for sharing and it's great for within Sheets. Okay. So this is what I use for conference schedules. My students, I, I publish this out to it with a link so the parents can see it. They can't edit, they can't click on it, but then they can respond back with what time they want. So if someone wanted the 215 slot, they can see that it's open. I fill it in and about you know within five minutes it's updated, it's live, and they can have a live picture of it, but then no one's going in and editing. I don't have to worry about students editing it. It's 100 percent right then and there. You could do it with other data as well. One of my other favorite, so I've got like three little tips and tricks. If you grab the little blue box in the corner of a series 
and drag it down, it will continue that series and pattern. So if it's numbers like one, two, three, four, and you grab it and drag down, it'll continue that numbering system, which makes it really easy to do checklists, to do sign-in sheets. Um, and if you have a pattern like ABCD that you wanna have repeat, it'll then repeat that pattern over and over again. And if it senses a pattern, like here, two, five, eight, eleven, it caught on that there was a that there were th basically everything was counting by threes. It'll then continue that pattern. So, highlighting and dragging has saved me so many times when I'm trying to make a quick sh sheet, and I just need to continue the pattern. Filters, filters allow you to take pretty much any table of data, and then manipulate it and sort without losing the integrity of your document. So this is something I use with my student progress reports when I wanted to highlight, look for specific data, for specific data. I select, you select filter. And once you select filter, you basically you highlight the range of, of, of information that you want. So maybe you'll, so in this case, I highlighted, whoo, I highlighted everything from first name all the way down. And then I was able to, it gives me these little triangle symbols here up by the first name, by, by Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And when I click on it, it gives me different ways I can sort the data. And it doesn't eliminate the data, it doesn't. So whenever, so I sort it by last name or by first name, all of the data, data associated with that student follows them and reorders accordingly. So then I can then look at how every, all my students are doing maybe in language arts on Monday and go, okay, these are the students who nailed Monday's lesson. And these are the students who didn't complete their work. I can email those parents right now. So I can also filter by students by color. I can filter by all sorts of different things. It doesn't have to be just alphabetical, but it's really nice when I'm looking at SBAC scores, I can then sort by the domain. Within the domain, how, they, how each individual student did sorting from sorting numerically. So, yes. And then, how I so conditional formatting is the other thing I do when I'm looking at data. So if I'm looking at SBAC data, if I'm looking at grades grading data, basically with conditional formatting, it basically looks something like this. So these are scores that I had different domains within math. And I went ahead and I said everything I made a rule basically, so that everything up to 100 was red. So zero to 100 is red. 100 to 300 is orange. 300 to 500 is yellow, and then 500 and above is green. And that was my parameters. And what I did was I highlighted the data that I wanted to use this rule. And so like, that's my range, all the data that I highlighted. And then I formatted the rule. So if the text contained, or I said, or I could click on, the, on that and select if the data, if, if, the, if it's, the value is between, and I could then put in those numbers and then I could go ahead and then it would automatically colors in my data for me. So I can see which students are proficient, which students are struggling and I can sort them accordingly using the filter. So all of that together creates a really powerful tool. Students can also, you can also use conditional formatting to create pixel art and create it or even a self validating form. So if a student enters a, the correct answer it'll turn green for that space, potentially. So there's a variety of different things depending on how you set your rules. So if I said that this, that let's say one of these cells is a six, needs to be a six, then when a student puts in a six, it would turn green. So, um, okay, all right. And the best part about that is once you conditionally format one thing, you can highlight and copy and paste the formatting onto another document. So say you did it for yourself and your colleagues like, oh my goodness, that's like the best thing ever. Well, you can take the formatting from your document and copy and paste it into their version of it, which is really nice when you're looking at data and you want to compare. It's a great way to be able to look at everyone's data. So there's instructions here on how to do that. It's literally just copy and then pasting special in the menu and it'll just paste your conditional formatting only right there. So there's some really great stuff when you look into the editing. And I, Laura, I'm not sure why you can't see the top of the screen and I'm so sorry, because if I could fix it, I would. <laughs> and I'm not, I, so, and if you've ever seen these wonderful pixel art mysteries, they have a whole Facebook group dedicated to it where people are sharing pixel art that they've made 
as well at the end is to all tied to content typically that's so basically a mystery it doesn't show up and then as students put in their answers the conditional formatting makes the picture appear so if you're interested in that pixel art mysteries on facebook is a great way to do that and krista it's all yours breath all right, so um, I don't want to talk too much about Google Classroom because you guys are probably pretty burnt out on Google Classroom and you're experts at it by now. But I did want to share this new feature. Um, can you go to the next slide? So if you've heard of Alice Keeler, she's amazing. She's one of my icons, but she is working on something called Schoolytics. And it works in conjunction with Google Classroom. And if you've used Google Classroom, and I'm pretty sure most of you have, you know that the data that it provides is not super user friendly or viewer friendly. So Schoolytics is working to improve that. I would highly recommend that you create your free teacher account like tonight and get your classroom set up for next year. You can have up to 10 classrooms in Schoolytics with your free educator account. And then the features you can see on the left graphic, you can identify who your disengaged students are, who your lower performing students are, which students might need your intervention. Um, and also you're missing assignments. And then it generates these amazing graphs, which you can see over on the right hand side. I love it. I just found it. Um, I was telling Laura all about it this morning. I'm very excited about Schoolytics. So please make an account, use it. It will be your best friend. All right. And then these are some other new features um, that Google for EDU um, is going to be rolling out over the next several weeks, several months. I'm not sure what the time frame is, but just be on the lookout for these new features. Okay, so there's a lot you can do with calendar, but I'm really going to focus on how you can take the calendar that's embedded in Google Classroom. So every Google Classroom that you create has a Google Calendar. And so when you go into your Google Calendar, you it's present there. But what you can do is you can actually publish your Google Calendar so that you can share it with as a link essentially with your family with families, with other teachers potentially. And so this is my May from 2020 <laughs> calendar where you can see all the assignments that were due specifically for students. And this is great because sometimes you publish after or you put, put out assignments after the, um, the, the parent emails go out from that are embedded into that you can activate within Google Classroom. And this is a way for parents to really keep track of like what's due and when. And, and if they hover over one of these assignments, it gives them the basic details. There's no student details. It's just the basics of the assignment of what you put in. So there's, you basically, you can, you, you can also create a new calendar and have that calendar um, also be published as well. Um, but you need to head over to settings. And once you're in settings, you can either create a new calendar or if you go down to your classroom calendar and click on settings and sharing, not only can you change the color coding of your calendar, but you can then change the access permission and you need to change it so that it's available to public so that they can see and you can choose whether or not they see event details or just the basics. And once you've done that, scroll even farther because it's all the way down to the bottom it gives you the public URL to the calendar. And that public URL, you can then share with families, you can embed on, into a Google site, and it gives them the information about, like, you know, Friday, we're gonna be playing a class-wide game of Battleship today in our meet. Show up, be there, be square. But it tells, um, but it gives the parents the very basic details of what's gonna be happening in, that, in the class at that time, so. And then, of course, when you add events, just make sure that you are adding it to your Google Classroom calendar. It's like if you're going to add a field trip, you then add it to the Google Classroom calendar that you're utilizing and sharing with parents, not to your personal one. It'll still show up for you, but you want to make sure it's accessible to your parents who may not be able to see, who shouldn't be able to see your personal calendar. All right, Krista, Jamboard, let's get our jam on. All right. So um, 
a favorite, right? We all um, hopefully have explored with Jamboard a little bit over the past year, but let's dig a little deeper. Um, with Jamboard, the student and or teacher is able to write, draw, and type. So it gives you some options. You're also able to resize any images that you put onto your Jamboard or any text. Um, you can search the web to find images and you can also share this. It's a collaborative document. Next slide, please. So these are just some of the ways that um, I've gathered that you can use Jamboard um, and you can can refer back to this later on. Um, we're going to talk just a little bit about it right now. Next slide, please. All right, so here are the basics. You can see um, these are your tools over there on the left. You've got your pen, your eraser, your select, your sticky note. You can add an image and that image can come from your drive or you can do a Google image search or you can upload from your computer. Um, and so on. So we are actually going to play with Jamboard now. So, um, if you could please put that link in the chat, Jacob, and you should see here a Venn diagram. And sometimes it'll take a while for it to load, especially for students if they're on a really slow internet connection. And if, if that's the case, sometimes having them leave a meet and then return to a meet if you're online or closing out other things on their Chromebook helps Jamboard load. All right, so um, you guys all have access to this. And um, as a refresher, a Venn diagram on the left, we've got in-person school. And on the right, we have virtual school. And then the section in the middle is what these two have in common. So using your tools over on the left side, you can write or you can use a text box. Or you can insert images, whatever you want. Please fill in something on this Venn diagram. Like the picture. Teacher learning happens. I love the sticky note. Remember, um, anything that you put onto your Jamboard can be resized. So if you want to make it smaller or larger, feel free to do that. <laughs> Aww. And one important little tip, I'm sure you might be getting into this, Krista, is using the background. Mm -hmm. so if you have elements that you don't want to be erased, if someone hits clear frame or starts, you know, getting a little, you know, a little, a little sassy with their use of Jamboard, um, putting things in the background that you want to be static is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Collaboration, yeah, hands on. Great. And you can see how um, you can put in any graphic organizer as your background, and then you can make a copy for each student or you can work on it whole class. Um, this is also a great virtual whiteboard, right? My, my document camera went missing in the middle of the school year. So I used Jamboard for all of my math lessons. So um, keep this in mind. Great, thank you guys for participating. Lots of good um, negatives and positives with both, right? And some students thrive in both, in person and virtual. All right, thank you. We can go to the next slide now. All right, so another feature I wanted to share with you, um, Alice Keeler, you know, I like her. She um, did this webinar on making Jamboard games and she kind of walks you through this in this YouTube video. Um, she's got checkers, she's got um, some academic Jeopardy games, uh, Battleship using coordinate graphing. So this is about a 30 minute webinar that you can check out later on. It's a good resource to have. And then um, we all want the free templates, right? We don't wanna have to build it from scratch if it's already out there. So here are 20 free interactive Jamboard ideas. 
And this is from Jill Stake. And um, you can see there, I listed what she has available on this site. So just click on the picture if you're on the bit.ly and it will take you to those templates where you can make copies of them. All right, and same thing from the Hello Teacher lady. So she's got a few here for corners, agree or disagree. Um, I felt like Jill stakes were more for older kids and then Hello Teacher lady, these are great for primary, um, just from what I saw. And apparently I clicked on the link without even trying to. So um, <laughs> it's a great resource for everyone and yeah. So welcome to my maps. Uh, so I came across my maps a few years ago. I don't remember, probably when they first, kind of when they first rolled out. In fact, I think actually the my maps, if I remember correctly, came out of a Google 20% uh, time. So when they gave their they gave their employees 20% to work on independent projects. And this was one of their projects that came out of that time. The link here for my maps will take you to um my mouse but it's really simple it's either you can either go into your drive it's actually linked in your drive or you can also just click go to mymaps.google.com it's part of the google family and and apparently i'm clicking on there to go so but we, we do not need to be there right now and what it allows you to do is allows you to create and collaborate okay allows you to create maps and collaborate around ideas so you can basically create your own map like this is my this is actually my favorite right now because i'm moving to sixth grade we're going to teach percy jackson for the first part of the school year it's one of my favorite books to like just for um young adult fiction and i wanted to share kind of what it looks like so this is a map of percy jackson's travel and his quest to try and retrieve the lightning bolt from hades and so it starts you basically each one of these thumb uh thumbtacks represents a location and this is someone was able to basically whoever created this went through and they basically logged each place and so you can not only create this as a teacher for students to explore but you can also use it um, have your students create their own and as you, you go through a book or as you travel do a science project or through social studies or even a math you can then have them engage collaboratively on a map logging information keeping basically creating like a journal essentially on a map kind of like you wouldn't back on the with the map on the wall and put thumbtacks in it, you can then log different pieces of information. So they logged Camp Half-Blood, they've the Empire State Building, um, key locations in the books as they went through. You could even have students add quotes from the book that describe what ha that, that location. And so here's some ideas of ways that you can actually utilize that. And we're having just all sorts of fun. So for science, you could log ecosystems. You could track migratory patterns and like track um, the monarch butterfly where it starts and where it ends for going through Pacific Grove and down into Mexico. You can look at distance between points. There's a ruler function that will, you can click and it will basically logs the distance between different points. You can create, you can shade in an area and figure out like the air, like, what well, how much what's the area of salinas or what's the area of your town or what's the area of these square blocks or what's the area of what's the perimeter and area of our school within social studies you could track immigration patterns this is a link to an oregon trail one i believe um, you could track geographical speech features landmarks national parks we use this in my family so that we could all log where we wanted to go on vacation. So we all put like our plate, like we're flying to Colorado. What are things that we want to see? We all logged it and we can kind of see the clusters of where we wanted to go. Um, I know there's a teacher in my school district who loves to, he has his students do a um, plan. Uh, they do, he was it? He sends them on vacation. And so they have to write a diary that matches the that matches the location and they have to create like an itinerary and show like where they went and where they ate. So all of those are places that things that you could do and it adds an extra dimension. You could have you could uh, have students log their family origins. I used it during COVID to create a map of where my students lived so I could then make deliveries super fast when I needed to drop off materials at their house. I knew exactly where I was going. And, uh, but I was, but I will say it, it, you can make them private. You can make them public. When I do put, did mine with my students, I was very careful to use just an initial 
So I knew who they were, but if anyone ever got, saw my map, they would have no idea who any of these people were or any of the locations. It was very, very vague. So be, you know, be cautious. I'll show you how to share and how to know if it's private or not. So when you create your My Map, it gives you a blank untitled map, essentially. You can title it. And then you'll see here you have the sharing settings. It's automatically private until you go in and share it. And then you can go ahead and click on any location on the map. So if you click, if you using the hand tool, if you scroll into a location that has like a marker already on Google Maps, like you know how when you scroll in to like look at a map in an area, you can click on a restaurant and it pops up with information. If you clicked on that, if you click on that that pop up, like here, the Salinas Valley Railroad Museum, I can then add it to my map, and that, then it creates that marker like this right here with the Bronda Adobe History Center so that my students, when they look at the map, they see this big giant blue, we can change the color too. So you can change the color to match specific types. So maybe it's a landmark versus a geographical feature. You can then differentiate like with a map key essentially based on color. And then you can add to your map, but then they know exactly what to click on. It gives them a link to their website. So this is also a great way to um, give your students resources in a visual way so they not so now they can see the map and then they can click on a resource to learn more about it so it can be almost like a choice board essentially where you so you can lay out all these different options and then they can go through and do research and explore on their own you can add an image so like as you can see harvey baker house it doesn't have anything here it's just a name the link and that's it if i click on the little camera icon, I can then use Google search to add a picture of that place. And I can also add markers for places that might not have an actual geographical tag, essentially. So like Harvey Baker House had, had a tag, I can click on and add it. But maybe I wanna add a point that doesn't have, that isn't necessarily associated with a specific place. Well, then I can go ahead and click that add a marker and then I can name it, label it, and give information on why I did that. So that's really great for like geographical features, maybe some topographical information, things that wouldn't necessarily show up on a map or be marked on a Google map. So in order to share, just so you all know, we that share button is your is your friend. And Right now, this is a private map. So in order to in, in order to share, I need to click enable link sharing. And then that would then, anyone I share the link with can then view it. But what if I want my students to actually be able to collaborate on it? That I have to go over here to drive sharing. And once I click on drive sharing, then it brings up the traditional Google Drive. And then you can go ahead and add the people that you want to be able to access and collaborate. And you need to make sure that they're editors. So but you could also share it with your, within your Google Classroom because it's a Google item. So if you wanted to share it with your whole class or you could share it with the groups of students within Google Classroom, there's ways that you can share it out with your class. It doesn't have to be adding each individual student because that would be really time consuming and we're not all about that. And if you head over to the three dots, like right here on the academic map where it says academic map and there's the three dots, it then brings up more options. So you can copy the map. So if you're if you see some if you see someone else's map that's public and you really like it, you can copy it. You can print it, but you can also embed it. So if you have a Google site, which is coming right up, you can also embed a Google map that helps, you know, maybe it's a resource or students, it's it's an option for you to do. So all of that. So yeah, three dots are your friend for being able to embed the map, copy a map. So and all I and a lot of times what you all have to do is Google my map and the topic or the book or the place that you're looking for, and ops and a lot of options will pop up with interactive maps and then you can also copy them and make them your own and edit and add to them. That was awesome. Thank you. I'm so excited about my maps. What a great way just to teach kids geography in general, you know. Thank you, Laura. Um, so let's talk about Google Sites. Um, we could spend all night talking about Google Sites and um, I think we've done individual um, webinars on Google Sites. Paul Dietrich, who's here with us right now, did one for us last summer and it is available on our YouTube channel. 
our YouTube channel and MBQs. So feel free to check those out if you want more details on how to build your site. I'm just going to kind of give you a quick overview. Um, so Google site is amazing for communication, not only with your students, but also with your students' families so they know how to support their child at home. Um, it's amazing to showcase projects, and I'll give you an example of that momentarily. And for you, it will be great to help you organize your units and the necessary materials you need. And it does it in a pretty way where you just click a button, you've got your lesson plans, you've got the graphic organizers you need. So um, Google Sites is great for your organization as well. Digital portfolios. At the end of the year, I've had my students showcase all of their work in a Google site, right? And then they can show that to their parents. Um, it's a great way to share pictures, videos, and other resources and personal storage as well. So um, the features that I like best, especially for this purpose, for communicating and simplifying your school year are the calendar, um, the image carousel. So you can put a bunch of images and the user just has to click on them to see the multiple images and it just kind of slides through. It works seamlessly, like we've talked about with docs, sheets, slides, um, like Laura said, my maps, you can embed a my map into your site. Um, there's a feature called the announcement banner, and you will find that in your settings of your site. And you can have something that really is highlighted, like back to school night on September 4th or whatever that you really want to stand out, right? And then you can also share videos. That link um, in your bit.ly where it says sites basic features is a three and a half minute recording of me going over the, um, the tools and how to use them um, in Google Sites. Feel free to check that out later if you need help building your site, um, but we're running a little short on time, so I'm just going to keep rolling. All right, so um, this is my classroom website. Um, feel free to navigate it, take a look, make a copy of it if you want, <laughs> um, but that's my site. And then I also, on the next slide, wanted you to see what a student created in my class. So we try to take some of the traditional projects that um, kids do, like for instance, the state project in fifth grade, um, learning about geography of the United States. And in this case, this student had to convince me to visit their state and her state is Arkansas. So let's take a look at this one. Um, if you could click on that link, Laura, and it takes you to her site. And this is a 10 year old that built this. And um, a lot of them looked like, not all of them, but a lot of them looked really great. I mean, it looks like a professional travel website. You can see up at the top, she's got her different pages. She's got her attractions her major cities, the famous people that are from there. Um, it was also a, a math uh, project as well. If you click on the cost page, it tells the user how much it'll cost to fly from California to Arkansas. Um, so she had to calculate all that and rental cars and so on. So she gave me permission to share this with you. Feel free to take a look at it. And it just shows that um, it is a very user-friendly app. Thanks, Laura. You can go to the next slide. All right, so that is it for um, the six apps that we wanted to share with you. We wanted to show you this as well. Um, these are some other new and exciting features coming up in Google Workspace for education. Be on the lookout. Again, timeline, I'm not sure. I would highly recommend following the Google for EDU blog. If you just Google that, um, it'll allow you to subscribe and you get all this news um, in your inbox. All right, so we're gonna end this way we began essentially. And just what, what, which of the following do you think will help simplify your school year the most or what area did you find the tips most helpful? I guess would be another way to frame, frame it as well. So if you wouldn't mind dropping that in the chat so that way we kind of get a little feedback here on what things might be of interest. Yeah, which of the following do you think will help simplify your school year the most? Awesome. Google Sites was so, so crucial this past year. And I know that with a lot of our families, with the amount of communication that they've had just with us being in their living rooms half the time, 
that a lot of parents are going to be, and a lot of times I think a lot of our sites possibly parents may not be necessarily allowed on campus in the same way that they have been in the past, just for you know safety issues. The more ways we have to communicate and share with families, the better off we are. So I think having making sure you're having sites or forms or ways for parents to get in touch with you, getting that information right at the beginning of the school year is going to be crucial. So I love how some people can't pick just one. They oh, we can't. can't. <laughs> yes, thank you, Elizabeth. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel because this recording will be available um, by the end of the week, we're hoping. Um, all of the sessions we'll have this week. That next slide, Laura, yep. actually talks about, never mind, it didn't show up. We do have four more amazing sessions for you. So tomorrow, um, Miss Jen Rogers, who is here with us, um, she is our MBQ board president, will be talking to you about UDL and PBL and how to amplify student voice. Wednesday, Wednesday, do we have SEL or Edu protocols? It's edgy protocols, I believe. Edgy protocols with Kim, which is going to be amazing. Um, Thursday, we have Celia Salinas from Alisal. She's going to talk to us about SEL. It's um, going to be very important for us this upcoming year. And finally, on Friday, we have um, Will Frenzel and Rob Garcia from MCOE who are going to talk to us about how to prepare for the 2022 Student Powered Film Festival um, and really bring in this project based learning into your classroom. And even if you're not local and you're not like, oh, I'm not going to be participating in the Monterey Bay Film Festival, it's a great way to look at how you can possibly integrate um, the principles of videography and like that project based learning into your classroom. So, don't miss out on and really all of these I'm we're presenting tonight we're moderating for some of the other ones but I'm pretty sure I'm going to be here every night because it's that cool but it's also a great opportunity because I know we went pretty fast over some things so if you had any questions that you wanted to clarify it or other things you wish we could kind of go back over real quickly we have you know about 10 minutes left so that we can go ahead and do that in I know I went really fast over sheets initially. I felt really bad. I was like, how fast can I talk? Apparently we found out. <laughs> so. Yeah, so we're here to answer questions. Um, otherwise, have a wonderful night. We hope to see you back later in the week. Thank you for coming.